moonless night. The city lay shrouded in darkness, unusually silent, as if the very life had been drained from it. A strange, unnatural cold gripped the streets, seeping into the buildings, winding through alleyways and reaching into every hidden corner. In the dead of night, people huddled in their beds, covers drawn tightly around them, yet the chill found them, clinging to their skin, pressing into their bones. It began as a faint sound, a whisper, barely audible, weaving through the air like a dark lullaby. The voices were soft, sinister, like someone calling just beyond sight. One by one the sleeping stirred, eyes fluttering open in the darkness. Fear crept over them as they strained to listen, hearts pounding, but there was nothing they could see. Only the shadows stretching across the room. Alone in their beds, they felt the presence, cold and heavy, as if something was watching, waiting. Whispers grew louder. Each victim lay still, paralysed by the icy dread, as the voice grew clearer, colder, calling them, drawing nearer. Their breaths quickened, the room seeming to close in, walls fading as the whisper grew louder, echoing through their minds, filling them with a nameless terror. Some tried to reach for the light, but their hands wouldn't move, limbs frozen by the weight of their own fear. Room to room, house to house, the whisperer drifted, her pale form sliding like mist through walls and doors. Her cold, hollow eyes peered into the darkness, seeing each soul cowering beneath blankets, the last fragments of warmth slipping away as she drew closer. Her touch was a silent curse, her gaze a death sentence. She needed no weapons, no words. Just the suffocating chill of her presence was enough. And so, the city fell silent once more, as victim after victim succumbed to her power, their faces frozen in expressions of sheer, unimaginable terror. When dawn broke, it cast a dim, grey light over a city struck by horror. Words spread like wildfire. Police sirens pierced the morning air. Neighbours gathered in shock, their faces pale as they recounted the stories of those who hadn't woken. Hundreds of people, ordinary, innocent souls, were found lying in their beds, their bodies frozen, their eyes wide, their faces twisted in expressions of fear that could never fade. The pale whisperer had claimed them all. Stephen Lestat moved with eerie calm through the streets, his face a mask of solemn concern as he spoke with the authorities. A mass tragedy had struck overnight, and he had offered his services to assist. His reputation as a brilliant, albeit eccentric, scientist opened doors, and his voice was soft, reassuring, as he questioned each officer about the strange deaths, hinting at answers he claimed to be pursuing for the good of the city. But in truth... Stephen had a far darker purpose. Those who had perished were no longer just victims. They were his potential soldiers, an army waiting to be awakened. He carefully persuaded the authorities to allow him to take possession of the bodies for specialised research on the unexplained deaths. By mid-afternoon, his vans were loaded, filled with the frozen corpses, each face frozen in the stark, horrifying expression of death they had met in the night. As he directed his staff to unload the bodies at his private lab, Stephen's face broke into a dark, triumphant grin. Yes, he thought, she will supply me with perfectly preserved bodies, an endless fuel for our army. His whispers to Necross went unanswered, but he felt the approving gaze of his dark lord. He knew he was fulfilling the vision they had shared. Inside his hidden laboratory, hundreds of bodies lay neatly lined on the floor. A morbid assembly, men, women and even children, all victims of the pale whisperer. To any ordinary person, it would have been a scene of unspeakable horror, but to Stephen, it was magnificent. Like a man possessed, Stephen darted from one body to the next, his hands trembling with excitement. He uncorked a vial of thick, greenish liquid, swirling it for a moment before pouring it down the throat of each corpse. The concoction was vile, 
a toxic mix of herbs, chemicals, and something far older, a recipe whispered to him by Necros himself. As the liquid seeped down their throats, each body twitched, a faint shudder at first, and then a slow, painful jerk. The limbs stiffened, then began to move, eyes that had once been frozen in terror now flickered open, dull and glassy, devoid of life yet filled with purpose. Yes, Stephen whispered, barely containing his exhilaration. Rise, my children, rise and serve the will of Necros. One by one the bodies sat up, moving stiffly at first, then with greater ease as if relearning the act of movement. Stephen watched, his hands trembling with the thrill of success, as his hundred-strong army rose to their feet, standing in silent obedience, awaiting his command. The room, filled with the faint sound of shuffling feet and laboured breaths, a grotesque symphony that echoed through the cold, dark lab. Stephen stood before them, his eyes gleaming with manic delight. Look at you, he murmured, his voice thick with pride. Perfectly preserved, loyal, an army that will answer only to me, to us. He raised his arms, his voice rising in fervour. Soon you will march. You will spread death across this city, and we shall claim all those who dare defy us. The army of the undead stood ready, silent and unmoving, awaiting the word that would send them into the world beyond the lab. And Stephen Lestat, with the power of Necros behind him, felt unstoppable. Night fell once more, and with it came a chill that seemed to creep up from the ground, spreading through the city like a poisonous fog. The pale whisperer emerged from the shadows, her form barely visible, a cold, spectral presence that seeped into the very soul of the night. She felt nothing but vengeance, her hollow eyes fixed on her goal, her mind a cold storm of anger. With silent, merciless precision, she drifted from house to house, apartment to apartment. Her touch was as frigid as death itself, claiming each victim without hesitation. Whispers filled the rooms, faint and sinister, like dying breaths caught on the wind. As her cold presence swept through each home, bodies lay still, frozen in place, their faces locked in horror, forever marked by the darkness that had claimed them. Across the city, terror gripped those who lay awake, shivering in their beds, as though an unseen hand was squeezing the life from their very hearts. People felt the chill of her approach, an inexplicable, soul-deep cold that froze them in place, unable to escape the fate that awaited them. And then, just as suddenly as it began, the night ended. Morning. Panic in the city. When dawn broke, the city was in a state of chaos. Word spread rapidly, frantic whispers of fresh victims found in their beds, perfectly preserved but lifeless, their faces twisted in terror. Fear took hold of the people, families locked their doors, neighbours avoided each other, and no one dared venture out after dark. But Stephen Lestat was ready. He approached the authorities with a carefully crafted story, his voice steady, a tone of urgency in his words. He explained how these strange deaths could be the result of a new, unknown disease, one capable of spreading like wildfire. For the safety of all, he advised, the bodies should be quarantined, moved to his private facility, a disease research centre. He assured them was equipped with state-of-the-art security. There's no time to waste he insisted, his voice calm but insistent. Any one of these bodies could contain the outbreak. Only my facility has the equipment necessary to ensure this doesn't spread. Reluctantly, the authorities agreed, and by afternoon, van after van rolled up to Lestat's private morgue, a secure, unmarked facility on the outskirts of the city. They unloaded the corpses, each one carefully transferred to Stephen's hands. 
his team under strict orders to keep them isolated. Stephen watched each body arrive with an intense, barely contained joy. To the untrained eye, he looked like a scientist simply doing his duty, but inside his heart raced with excitement. He watched as his patients were carried through the doors, rows of frozen faces, all ready to become part of his grand design. As the last body was brought into the morgue, Stephen could barely contain his delight. He moved through the room, trailing his fingers over the corpses, his lips curling into a wicked grin. Hundreds of victims lay before him, silent and still, a perfect army awaiting his command. The pale, lifeless faces stared back at him, their expressions frozen in their final moments of terror, and to Stephen, each face was a triumph, a mark of his rising power. Yes, he whispered, his voice filled with awe. Yes, you will serve me, each and every one of you. Together, we will bring death back to this world. His voice rose to a fever pitch, echoing through the cold, sterile room. He turned to the ceiling, arms stretched wide, his laughter filling the space, a sound of pure madness and exhilaration. There is no one who can stop me, he cried out, his eyes gleaming with fervour. I am Lestat, I am the necromancer, and death shall walk this earth again. The words hung in the air, a dark promise, a proclamation of power that resonated through the walls and as he stood in his morgue, surrounded by the bodies of the fallen, Stephen knew he was unstoppable. The pale whisperer would bring him more, and his undead army would rise, legions of the dead, ready to follow his every command. His laughter echoed in the silence, a chilling sound that seemed to blend with the very whispers that haunted the city, as if the pale whisperer herself was pleased by her ally's twisted ambition. Stephen Lestat stood alone in his darkened lab, his gaze fixed on the rows of bodies before him, each one a silent soldier in his growing army. His face was alight, with a mix of reverence and fervour as he spoke softly, as though in conversation with a presence only he could perceive. "'You were right, my lord,' he murmured, his voice low and filled with awe. "'She is perfect.' for the creation of our army. She will continue to bolster our numbers, and she will never stop. Lestat closed his eyes, and in that moment he glimpsed a vision of the pale whisperer's past, a tale of innocence twisted by the hand of Necros. Centuries ago, in a time long forgotten, Isolde was beloved by her people. Her village, a modest settlement, nestled in a lush valley, was kept healthy by her tireless work. She was their healer, their guardian, the one they'd turn to when fever struck or wounds festered. With her knowledge of herbs, she crafted remedies to soothe pain, cure sickness, and protect her people from disease. Her gentle heart, her unwavering kindness, made her a beacon of hope in a world filled with uncertainty. But even in those peaceful days, whispers had begun to spread. They were quiet at first, like faint murmurs drifting through the village, a creeping doubt that darkened her reputation in the eyes of those she loved. The whispers were insidious, growing louder with each passing day, feeding on fear and suspicion. How does she know so much, they asked. Why does she live alone away from the others? Could it be witchcraft? Unbeknownst to his older, it was Necros himself who had sown these seeds of distrust. The Dark Lord's voice slithered into the minds of the villagers, subtle and persistent, bending their thoughts, planting fear where there had once been only love. He had a plan for her, a twisted purpose that only he understood. In her despair, her anger, she would become his, a weapon moulded by betrayal. The villagers turned on her, with the cruelty of those convinced of their own righteousness. They drove her out, cast stones and slurs, until she was forced to flee into the wilds, into the cold, where she would face her death alone. And as she lay in the snow, 
Her final breath slipping from her lips, she whispered a promise of vengeance that Necros heard, a promise that would bind her to him forever. Present day, the March of the Dead, the vision faded, and Stephen found himself back in the present, standing before his army, hundreds strong, the risen dead, with empty glassy eyes awaiting his command. He could feel the power thrumming through them, a dark energy that connected each corpse to him, a conduit of Necros's will. Lestat's eyes gleamed, and he lifted his arms, his voice echoing through the cavernous room. I am ready, my lord, he proclaimed, his tone filled with uncontainable excitement. I can wait no longer. Today I will march on them, and the Whisperer will feed our army. Together we will conquer the living. He looked over the legion of dead before him, his lips curling into a dark smile. Soon all shall bow to Necros. Let it be so. The undead stirred at his words, a ripple of movement spreading through the crowd. The time had come. The pale Whisperer would do her work in the night, claiming more souls, and each body would strengthen their ranks, each spirit would swell the army of Necros, and as Stephen prepared to unleash his army upon the city, he knew there would be no stop in them. The living would fall, and the world would remember the name of Lestat, the necromancer. Night descended over the city like a shroud, cast in long shadows that seemed to reach out with icy fingers. As the clock struck midnight, the pale whisperer moved silently through the streets once more, her form barely visible, but her presence felt by all who lay in their beds, gripped by a cold that no blanket could warm. Her anger seethed, her resolve hardened by vengeance, and she drifted from one home to the next, claiming life after life, each victim joining her in death's embrace. But tonight, there was something different in the air. Suddenly, a commotion broke out on the far edge of the city. From the dark woods beyond the town limits, an army of two hundred undead emerged, moving in lockstep, their faces blank, their eyes hollow, driven by a single, unrelenting purpose. Stephen Lestat, hidden in the shadows on the outskirts, watched with dark satisfaction. He stayed back, careful not to reveal his connection to the attack, but his heart thrilled with the sight of his growing army. As the undead advanced, chaos erupted. Screams filled the night as they broke into homes, dragging the living from their beds and attacking without hesitation. Each bite from the undead carried Lestat's twisted creation, a toxic rebirth, a dark contagion, that turned the living into the dead. It wasn't long before those bitten rows, their eyes glazed, and joined the ranks of the undead. The army grew, doubling in size as it consumed everything in its path, a plague of death sweeping through the city. The city's authorities scrambled to mount a defence, but the response was futile. Police, firefighters, and even local militias attempted to hold the line but each wave of resistance only added to Lestat's forces. For every defender who fell, another undead rose, their bodies twisted into soldiers for Necros. Lestat watched from the shadows, a dark smile on his lips as the city descended into madness. He looked over the sea of undead, his heart swelling with triumph. The world was finally bending to the will of Necros, and he, Lestat, was the instrument of that destruction. My lord, he whispered, looking to the sky, everything is going according to your will. But then, in the dead silence that followed, he heard something unexpected. A low, deep howl echoed through the night, resonating from somewhere within the city. The stat's smile faltered, and his eyes narrowed. He looked up to the sky, and there it was. The full moon, casting an eerie glow over the chaos below. Another howl pierced the air, louder, primal, 
vibrating with a power that made Lestat's heart skip a beat. No, he murmured, his face tightening with concern. They wouldn't dare. He turned his gaze toward the heart of the city, where the sound had come from, and for the first time, a flicker of doubt crept into his mind. He knew the legends, the ancient forces that had protected this world in times long past, and if they were answering the call, if they dared to confront him and the army of Necros, then his victory might not be as certain as he thought. Another howl shattered the night, echoing through the streets, and Lestat could feel the power rising. His eyes narrowed, his jaw clenched. This was no ordinary resistance. Something ancient had stirred, and for the first time, Lestat's confidence wavered. The army of the undead marched on, relentless, consuming all in its path. But now, somewhere in the shadows, something else was moving, something powerful, something that would not let the city fall without a fight. And as Lestat stared into the night, he realised his conquest had awakened more than he had bargained for. The city was in chaos, gripped by an unstoppable force of death and decay, while the pale whisperer roamed through homes and claimed victim after victim, leaving a trail of frozen terror in her wake. The undead army pressed on, moving like a dark tide through the streets. A desperate attempt to barricade the central avenues had been made. Soldiers lined the hastily constructed barriers, their faces tense and fearful as they held their positions. Hold your ground! A captain shouted, his voice barely audible over the panicked murmurs of his men. The soldiers peered into the shadows, their minds racing with questions. Was this some kind of riot? A terrorist attack? None of them could imagine the horror that awaited. And then, from the darkness, they emerged. Hundreds of undead creatures, shuffling, staggering, but with a relentless determination. Their hollow eyes glowed faintly, and the green ooze that animated them glistened under the dim streetlights. Open fire, the captain commanded, and the soldiers obeyed without hesitation. Gunfire rang out, bullets tearing through the undead. Bodies fell, limbs were torn apart, and for a moment it seemed they might succeed in holding them back. But the wave of undead kept coming, their numbers too great, and the soldiers found themselves quickly overwhelmed. Prepare to retreat, the captain yelled, his voice strained. We cannot hold them off. But before the soldiers could pull back, a dark, hulking shape shot through the air, leaping over their heads and crashing into the fray. A second shape followed, both landing with a thunderous impact that sent shockwaves through the ranks of the undead. The soldiers stared, stunned, as two massive beasts tore into the enemy lines, their claws slicing through the undead like they were paper. Two primal werewolves, the Alpha Prime and the Alpha, had arrived. These were no ordinary wolves. They were embodiments of pure power, creatures of raw muscle and rage. Their eyes glowed with a fierce ancient light, their fur bristling as they unleashed their fury on the undead. One by one, the undead fell before their claws, heads severed, limbs torn apart, bodies broken beyond repair. The werewolves moved with primal grace, each strike purposeful, each kill decisive. A soldier let out a triumphant shout. Yeah, they're on our side. Give them some support. The soldiers, hearts lifted by this unexpected help, took aim once more, picking off the undead with renewed determination. Each shot counted, each bullet finding its mark as the soldiers fought side by side with the two massive wolves. The werewolves tore through the undead ranks, their roars and growls blending with the gunfire in a terrifying but exhilarating symphony. Minutes later, the battlefield was silent. The undead lay in twisted, motionless piles, green ooze leaking from their broken bodies. The Alpha 
and the Alpha Prime lifted their heads to the sky, unleashing a victorious howl that reverberated through the city, a sound of defiance and victory against the forces of darkness. From his hidden vantage point on the outskirts, Lestat clenched his fists, watching in furious disbelief as his precious undead fell. His lips curled in a sneer, but then his expression changed. A dark, twisted smile spread in across his face. Go ahead. Celebrate, he whispered to himself. But how do you plan to kill the dead? Back at the barricade, the soldiers lowered their weapons, breathing sighs of relief. But as the silence settled, one of them shouted, What's that? They watched in horror as the green ooze began to pool together, seeping from the shattered remains of the undead bodies. Slowly, it crawled back toward the corpses, merging with them, filling in the torn flesh and broken bones. One by one, the undead began to stir, their limbs knitting back together, their eyes flickering to life. The Alpha and the Alpha Prime exchanged a look of concern. The Alpha, visibly fatigued from the fight, shook his head, his breaths heavy and laboured. They had never encountered anything like this. These undead were no ordinary enemies. They were fueled by the dark essence of Lestat's creation, a force that defied all natural laws. The werewolves watched, disbelief and frustration in their eyes, as the undead bodies rose, their wounds closing before their very eyes. The creatures stood once more, more resilient, almost fluid, their forms seeming to shift like water with each movement. The bullets fired by the soldiers passed through them, creating holes that closed as quickly as they appeared, the green ooze now acting as both flesh and armour. Realising they were outmatched, the Alpha and the Alpha Prime leapt back behind the barricade, joining the soldiers who stood frozen in terror. The soldiers fired desperately, but their bullets had no effect this time. It was like shooting into a mass of liquid, an enemy that could not be stopped. Lestat watched from afar, his eyes gleaming with triumph as the undead army advanced once more. He threw his head back, laughing into the night, his voice dripping with victory. Yes, my lord, he shouted to the heavens. Everything is going according to your will. Soon the living shall fall and all shall bow to Necross. And as the full moon shone down on the chaos below, the Alpha Prime and the Alpha looked at each other, their expressions grim. They had faced countless threats, fought battles across centuries, but never had they seen anything like this. For the first time, the primal wolves understood that they were up against a force that defied even their strength. The undead moved forward, unstoppable, their hollow eyes fixed on their living prey. The battle was far from over, and the city's last line of defence had only just begun. Pale Whisperer entered yet another quiet home, her form like a shadow slipping through the walls. She moved to the bed where a man lay sleeping, his breaths even, undisturbed by her presence. Leaning close, she whispered into his ear, the chill of her voice slipping into his dreams, ready to claim yet another life. But just as she prepared to take him, the man stirred, sitting up slowly. His voice was calm, almost tender, as he looked at her with eyes that seemed to pierce through her very being. Hello, Isolde. The whisperer froze, a wave of shock washing over her, her cold mask of vengeance momentarily cracking. She took a step back, her hands tightening as rage boiled within her. How did he know that name? Her name? I have but a few precious seconds to help you, my dear, the man said, his voice calm and steady. So please, don't try to kill me just yet. Give me but a moment, and if after this you still wish my life, then by all means take it. The whisperer, driven by blind fury, lunged at him, ready to silence him. But then she saw it, the glint of his face reflecting in the dim light. Only 
It wasn't a face. It was a chrome mask, shining back at her like a mirror, capturing her own distorted image. You have been betrayed, my dear, he said, his voice taking on a mournful tone. I have used all my power to reach you for these few moments, and I must return soon. But let me show you something first. Before she could protest, he raised a hand, and suddenly the world shifted around her. The Whisperer found herself standing in her village, the place she had once called home. She was no longer the vengeful spirit known as the Pale Whisperer. She was Isolde once more, young and full of hope. She moved through the streets, tending to the sick, offering herbs and remedies to the ailing, her heart filled with kindness and compassion. She looked down at her hands, clean and warm, her touch a balm rather than a curse. She saw the faces of the villagers, their eyes bright with gratitude as she healed their wounds and soothed their fevers. She had saved them countless times, her knowledge of healing a gift that had kept the village alive through hardship and illness. But as she turned, she saw something that chilled her to her core. Standing behind one of the villagers she had just cured was a shadow, a dark, twisted figure, whispering into the villager's ear. The man she had saved turned, his expression shifting from gratitude to suspicion, his eyes narrowing as he glanced at her. The figure behind him was unmistakable, an embodiment of Necros, his sinister presence tainting the villager's mind. Isolde's breath caught as she realised that Necros had been there all along, poisoning the minds of those she had once called family, planting seeds of fear and distrust in their hearts. The masked man beside her pointed to other villagers, and she saw Necros beside each of them, whispering in their ears, filling their minds with doubt and fear. The entire village had been swayed by his influence. Their love for her turned to hatred, their gratitude transformed into rage. They had driven her out, cast her into the wilderness to die, not because of her deeds, but because Necros had willed it. In that instant, she was back in the darkened room, standing before the man in the mask, his voice softened, filled with a sorrowful compassion. You have been betrayed, Isolde. This vengeance, it is not yours. It was never meant to be. The man looked at her with a steady gaze, as though he could see straight through her, to the soul that lay buried beneath layers of rage and bitterness. My time is done here, he said quietly. Reality calls me elsewhere. I hope you see the truth, Isolde, for this is not who you are. He turned, his form beginning to fade, his outline blurring into the shadows, but before he disappeared entirely, she caught one last glimpse of his mask, its mirrored surface reflecting her image, and behind her, the dark spectral form of Necros, his twisted mouth close to her ear, whispering words of hatred and anger. Isolde stared at the reflection, her mind racing, her heart aching with a forgotten pain. Had her life and death been a lie, twisted to serve another's purpose? The masked man's words lingered in her mind, unravelling the rage that had driven her for centuries. As the room fell silent once more, she stood there, alone, her mind torn between the vengeance she had sworn and the truth that had just been revealed. The Alpha Prime and the Alpha, battered but unbroken, prepared to leap back into the fray, their primal forms coiled with fury, ready to charge at the undead horde once more. The soldiers around them, readied their weapons, bracing for what they believed would be their last stand. But before any could move, a strange sound filled the air, a whisper, soft and rhythmic, a language none recognised, yet all understood, on a primal level. The whispering voice seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere, weaving through the night like a spell. The Alpha and the Alpha Prime halted, ears pricked, their muscles tense, the soldiers lowered their weapons, eyes widening in confusion and awe. An icy fog rolled over the barricade, cloaking everything in a pale, ghostly light. 
the undead continued their relentless advance, clambering over the makeshift barricades, reaching out with decaying hands. But then, abruptly, they stopped. Lestat, observing from his hidden vantage point, squinted, his confident smirk faltering as he watched his precious army falter. A change rippled through the undead ranks. They began to twitch, jerking their heads, as though hearing something from all directions at once. Panic spread across their twisted faces, their hollow eyes darting wildly. The soldiers watched in disbelief as the undead began to turn on one another, their limbs flailing as they clawed at anything within reach, including their own ranks. A bizarre, chaotic scene unfolded as the undead clashed with one another, driven by unseen forces, their own bodies no longer under Lestat's control. Those who had once been bound by Necro's green, viscous ooze were now tearing each other apart, bones cracking and limbs flying in a nightmarish frenzy. In moments, the streets were filled with chaos as undead fought undead, their mindless violence consuming them until nothing was left. Within minutes, the entire horde lay in ruins, their twisted bodies littering the ground in broken piles. Only a few undead remained, staggering toward the barricade in their final, pitiful attempt at an attack. But as they moved, an intense cold seized them, freezing the very goo that animated their forms. The toxic ooze crystallized, spreading through their bodies like ice, until they stood as frozen statues, hollow shells of the monsters they once were. With one final shuddering breath, they collapsed, lifeless. A loud cheer erupted from the barricade, as the soldiers realised what had happened. Relief washed over them, and they lifted their arms, a cheering in victory, disbelief and joy, the Alpha Prime and the Alpha, their own blood-stained and battered, lifted their heads to the sky, letting out a victorious howl that echoed through the city, a primal cry that celebrated the unexpected reprieve. As the soldiers and the wolves celebrated, a lone soldier at the edge of the barricade caught a glimpse of something in the distance. Peering into the fog, he saw a figure, a tall, gaunt woman, with long silver hair, her face worn and lined with the scars of a life long past. She stood silently, watching from the shadows, her expression unreadable, and then, to the soldier's astonishment, she smiled, a slight, knowing smile that sent a chill down his spine. He blinked, and when he looked again, she was gone, leaving only the icy fog and the broken remains of the undead in her wake. Somewhere beyond the barricades, Lestat stumbled back, his face a mask of rage and confusion. His army, his grand plan, had crumbled to dust, torn apart by forces he could not see or understand. And as he heard the howls of the wolves, and the cheers of the living, he clenched his fists, his mind racing with questions. In that silent, frozen city, Lestat understood one thing. He was not the only one with power in this game. The final confrontation. Lestat felt it before he saw it, the chill creeping over him, the fog rolling in thick, icy and foreboding. He turned, and there she was, the pale whisperer, her face stern and unyielding as she looked upon him. Her presence was no longer shrouded in rage. It was quiet, intense, a force of nature in its own right. There will be others, Lestat sneered undeterred. Do not think this is the end. Necros has eternity, for nothing can escape death. Without waiting for a response, he marched away, his mind already whirling with new schemes, new ways to wield the undead. Isolde could feel Necros's influence clinging to him, binding him to the powers of undeath, protecting him from her wrath, for now. Then, another presence stirred beside her. She turned, and her heart tightened as she recognised him instantly, the embodiment of Necros himself, now standing in human form, his gaze dark and piercing. Well, well, he murmured, a wicked smile tugging at the corners of his mouth. 
So it has come to this, Isolde. But no one thing. It wasn't just me who drove you. You wanted it too. You enjoyed taking those lives as much as I enjoyed receiving them. Tell me, can you truly say you want all of this to end now? His words struck her like a knife. She could feel the cold truth he wove into his statement, a haunting echo of the rage that had fueled her for so long. She knew what this meant. Necros was ready to reclaim his power over her, to draw back his essence and erase the pale whisperer forever. A voice cut through the fog, clear and sharp. Must I really face reality-destroying entities without having to come back here to solve your problems, Necros? even if just for a day. The ground trembled as a figure stepped forward, a man in a long coat, his face concealed behind a chrome mask. Winter. Nekrov's face twisted with annoyance. She is mine, he hissed, his voice cold with possession. I don't think so, Winter replied, stepping between them. He looked over at his older, his tone steady. It's been too long, Nekros. We really should catch up. Winter's gaze softened as he addressed his old. You were deceived, tricked into death, and robbed of the life you gave so freely. He glanced back at Necros, his voice calm but filled with a quiet strength. Necros knew what he was doing, manipulating you for his own power, but there's a way out of this. Necros sneered, but Winter ignored him his intellect already working, formulating a way to sever the bond that bound Isolde to death. He moved with precision, his understanding of reality itself, weaving around Necros's ancient magic, outmaneuvering the god of undeath with every step. Necros's eyes narrowed, anger smouldering beneath his calm facade, but as he watched, he could sense it. Winter's knowledge had grown beyond even his own, his intellect vast enough to bend the very fabric of reality. With a final flourish, Winter spoke a single word in a language lost to all but the oldest of realms. Isolde felt a surge of light pass through her, a warmth she had not known in centuries. The weight of her rage fell away, dissipating like morning mist under the sun. She was free. The chains of Necros's influence shattered, and in that moment she was no longer the pale whisperer, but something pure, something renewed. Isolde turned, gazing once more at winter, gratitude in her eyes. Without a word, she vanished, her spirit returning to the woods as a force of nature. She would be a guardian of the land, protecting its creatures, guiding lost travellers, a gentle presence rather than a harbinger of vengeance. As the fog lifted, only Necros and Winter remained. Necros glared at Winter, his expression cold and dark. One day, you will slip up, Winter, he said, his voice laced with quiet fury. Reality has given you too much leeway. Winter shrugged, his masked face giving away nothing. Well, Necros, I'd love to stay and chat, but at this very moment... I'm negotiating the very fabric of reality with a being so powerful that even you are nothing more than one of your shambling creations to him. And if I cannot stop him, you won't have to worry about much, because none of us will exist, or have ever existed. Winter paused, his voice calm but resolute. So, for your sake, I do hope you haven't taken too much of my time. I am the only one who can save us all, you included. With that, winter faded from view, leaving Necros alone. The god of undeath stood in the silent fog, his gaze fixed on the place where winter had vanished. Though his power was vast, his knowledge spanning eons, he knew, in the depths of his being, that winter was his salvation. And for the first time in countless centuries, Necros felt a sliver of uncertainty in his immortal heart. Thank you for watching. Remember, all the stories you hear on this channel are completely original. Your support, from likes, comments and super thanks to becoming a full member, 
is what keeps this channel alive and thriving. I couldn't do it without you. And I'm truly grateful for each and every one of you. Stay tuned for more chilling tales. And as always, thank you for being part of the Professor Shadow family.